a special guest on the line, uh, writer, director, uh, Mr. Richard Stanley. How you doing today, man? Uh, it's a pleasure talking to you, sir. You as well. Welcome to Replicon Radio. We appreciate you. Uh, I know you're a busy man. You got a busy schedule, so we appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us today. Um, I know we don't have a whole lot of time, so I kind of just want to let the listeners and the people who may not be familiar with you, just kind of a brief history of uh, uh, how you got started, kind of back in like the hardware days and things like that. Um, if you could just give them a little idea of. You well, know. yeah, I came out of a. You, gotta, you want to do it, or do you want me to do it? No, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I came out of a background of music videos in the 1980s. I was born in South Africa. Um, fled to South Africa at the time of the apartheid era. Got political asylum in England. Spent a good 10 years making um, music videos, which I translated into um, getting my uh, first feature credit with hardware, which was a, um, a low-budget, 800-grand sci-fi horror movie that um, punched well above its weight. Um, and, um, opened wide in the States at the time in a, a 700 print release. Um, and, um, yeah, basically got up and running from that point. Um, that eventually led through um, my second film, Dust Devil, to um, the island of Dr. Moreau, um, the um, 1995 um, Marlon Brando, one of the worst locations of all time. I mean, I imagine it was... Um, Maybe Fitzcarraldo or John Wayne's The Conqueror might have been worst movies to be on, but Dr. Moreau certainly has a reputation for being one of the most nightmarish um, production experiences of all time. I was um, removed from the project in favor of John Frankenheimer, ended up um, playing a, um, a beast person, a dog man on the project. Um, <clears throat> because of the various issues involved, um, To um, in the course of removing me, I had not um, actually broken contract, so... Um, Time Warner um, New Line's parent company was forced to um, pay me a rather large settlement at the farm Moreau that um, removed the need for me to have to work for a living anymore. So um, post Moreau, I was able to um, follow my nose and um, try to um, make a meaningful life for myself away from the film industry. I remember um, Marlon Brando at the time said that everyone in the industry were hyenas and I should try and um, get out into the real world and you know, find um, a life amongst you know, real non-industry folk. Of course, um, Brando had been in the industry so long he didn't realize just how bad things were in the outside world. Uh, they rapidly realized that um, people in, um, outside the industry were even worse than the folk at the film right. So I'm most happy to be back now. <laughs> So when you so after you know obviously that's there's a, there's even a documentary about the stuff that happened with the island of Moreau, or Doctor Moreau, um, but after that you actually you went and like so now we're talking about the color of space but your love for H.P. Lovecraft was started as a child you actually ended up moving to France because of your fandom for the author is that correct? Sort of. Um, I did move to the creepiest place I've ever come across. <laughs> Thank you. For, um, for creepy locations. Uh, but, um, when I first came to the place where I ended up living, I remember thinking it was exactly like um, like Dunwich or one of the um, neglected, isolated, inbred, backward small towns that Lovecraft's writing about yeah. in the midst of um, a very dark forest and a place where um, in Montsegur, um which was um, the site of the largest mass burning of witches and heretics in European history. Wow. The Catholic Church burned 300 people at the stake in Montsegur back in the, um, in the 13th century in the hope that the area would never rise again to confront Christianity. So um, it, it was described in period accounts as the, um, the synagogue of Satan or the serpent's head. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try and make a home for myself in the, um, in the previous place on the planet. Um, and um, and then work from there. That's crazy. What a what a wonderful it's place to decision, call home, a, huh? It's not a decision I've ever regretted. It's been um, I've had yeah ten um, outstandingly strange years there. That's awesome. So what was it? I mean, obviously, you know, you, you well. I assume I've heard you mention previously you're a big fan of HP. Um, what was it about the color out of space, or just in general, that made you decide after so long to come back? and to do another feature film? 
Well, I think um, in some funny way, H.P. Lovecraft's time has finally come. Um, close to 100 years after his death is um, is probably the um, the best-known horror writer in the world. And, um, his work has um, spread throughout our culture. I have a, um, a Cthulhu bag on my combat jacket. Uh, I can um, say, tell you firsthand that children in Africa, in Russia, in Japan, and in the French Pyrenees can instantly identify Cthulhu. And, um, they, they know the name of the deity, despite the fact that most of them don't know who Lovecraft is. And I'm, I'm amazed that this, um, the, that his weird um, alien um, metaphysical ideas have, um, have had the reach that they've gotten, um, despite um, not being promoted by any corporate power or any advertising agency. Um, Lovecraft's creative... Um, Lovecraft's shared universe, his creative universe, has, has spread entirely without um, help from anyone. Um, I think we're looking at some kind of psychoactive virus, or what um, evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins would have called a religious meme, um, an idea that somehow um, reproduces itself and um, spreads through imitation. That seems to have yeah, really wormed its way right into our culture. Um, this year, we're, we're about to see Jordan Peele's Lovecraft Country hit. Benioff and Vice, the Game of Thrones guys, have backed away from Star Wars to do their own Lovecraft movie. Uh, and I'm very much hoping that Guillermo del Toro will finally make good on his promise to do something with the Mountains of Madness. Mm-hmm. But either which way, it feels like the material's time has come. And um, it seemed to me that there were no um, strong, faithful adaptations of the major stories. Um, it seems very odd to me that there aren't um, five Call of Cthulhu's by now, let alone not even one. So um, I would like to see his work um, yeah, presented on screen the, the way it deserves. No, oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's it's and you know and and you know with the with his writing and the strange you know cosmic horror and the you know all the space things, we're we're at a point uh, I would say technically in making movies where some of those things will will actually be portrayed better than they may have been in previous uh, times with technology and stuff, too. So, and it's yeah, kind of... Yeah, crazily, we can actually... Go ahead. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, crazily, we can actually understand what he's talking about better now than we could in 1926. Yeah. There's a lot of ideas he throws up in the stories which are completely unfathomable to a 1920s readership. Like, um, he talks about, say, alien non-Euclidean geometry. Uh, which was a concept that was, yeah, even when I was in school, I used this phrase non-Euclidean on an essay, and I remember my teacher put a big red ring around us and said there's no such thing. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas now in the present day, we have fractal geometry, we have chaos science. Moreover, we use fractal geometry to create the, the effects that um, we use to, um, to illustrate these concepts in the film. So um, now we can imagine how... Um, fractal geometry or non-Euclidean geometry can be used to describe the chaos, to describe the um, underlying patterns and forces within chaos, which is very much something that um, Lovecraft is driving at with these um, his form of forces of chaos, his, his faceless um, deities. And, um, another idea is the, uh, that's, um, the actual color scheme within the film, where um, we're driving the whole time into towards ultraviolet and infrared towards yeah. the outer limits of the, the human spectrum, which isn't really an artistic decision. It's more of a decision based on, on pure mad science. And, um, the use of the, uh, the ultrasound and the infrasound are the same thing. They're, they're markers, which we feel are the, the outermost limits of um, what, we can, um, what we can hear or see. If um, some, a sound or something is going to come into our consciousness, it's going to have to come in through either ultra high pitched or very low bass, and until we finally hear it, the same I imagine for ultra dimensional intrusion into our world. I also studied a lot of UFO um, contactee stories, um, all of which have similar um, fingerprints, ideas of t- space time distortion, um, lost memories, um, and the kind of um, yeah, disorientation that um, is reported by folk who seem to have um, encountered something outside of the box or outside of their ability to um, to to easily conceive. Absolutely, yeah. It's a, it's definitely a whole new world now, and people are a lot more. You know, we know a lot more things, and people are minds are more open to more things as well, whether they believe them or not. At mm. least they're willing to uh, 
to accept them. You know what I mean? At least for entertainment value, if not for uh, for actual reasoning. Um, I mean, the whole idea of a multiverse of the, of, of multiple possible parallel worlds existing in the same place is something I think people are uh, much more able to accept now than um, they might have done before the war. I'm amazed that Lovecraft was writing this material before the invention of LSD, uh, before the counterculture ever has. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Um, so with The Color of Space, it actually comes out in theaters on the 24th of January. Uh, features Nicolas Cage, Tommy Chung, uh, our friend Elliot Knight as well. For anybody out there that goes, for you, for you, uh, what do you want the the viewers to get out of this movie if they were to get anything from uh, from seeing it? Well, above all else, regardless of um, that's, that's uh, um, the um, the absolutely gonzo socio political context. Um, I, I'm hoping the film is delivering a ride like that other. Because above all else, I tend to see my work as being a kind of deadpan apocalyptic black comedy, and I think I share that sensibility with Mr. Cage. Um, sure. Living something which is, by turns, both funny and horrible. Uh, and, um, if it can be a little thought provoking at the same time, then so much the better. Absolutely. Um, so I know we're, we're basically out of time. I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but everybody's talking about, you know, after 20 plus years, you return to feature film. We got this one coming out on the 24th. Can we expect, or do you have ideas to be, to stay in this realm again? Are you back? Is Richard Stanley writing and directing? Can we see more of you in the future, possibly doing more features? Um, yeah. um you're totally well. I'm pleased to say that, um, color's already been such a hit on paper that we've already embarked on the second installment of what's now become a, a Lovecraft trilogy. Oh, wow. So um, I'm currently adapting um, the Dunwich Horror into a feature film, which I'm hoping we'll be able to shoot this autumn or winter. Awesome. Which will be a, um, a, um, a faithful adaptation of the original story, once again updated to an apocalyptic MAGA era Arkham County. And we'll also follow on from the, um, the themes of color. Um, Elliot Knight as Ward Phillips, the voice of Lovecraft, and Color is set to be the only um, continuing character, essentially. Oh, and wow. It will give me a chance to gradually in, enlarge on the themes broached in the first movie. Um, in um, Dunwich, we will get first time since Reanimator and um, get into the issue of the Necronomic and the Black Book at the core of um, Lovecraft's mythology which will also open up the issue of um, the return of the old ones and pave the way for um, the mooted third movie, which is clearly going to have to be um, a world-ending apocalypse. That's exciting. I'm sure Lovecraft, fan, Lovecraft fans are going to be ecstatic to, to hear about that. I know everybody loves to, to see the, the stories come to life and stuff. I think, so. I think Lovecraft fans are facing a year like none other. Uh, with um, George Peel's Lovecraft Country about to land, uh, uh, Betty Off advice the Game of Thrones guys backing away from Star Wars through their own Lovecraft project. And, um, tentacles showing up in pretty much everything these days, yeah. um, from the lighthouse through most recently underwater. Um, we're seeing a, um, a Lovecraft boom at the moment, which um, is completely beyond anything I could have expected. That's awesome. That's exciting. Um, is there anywhere for uh, for fans who want to know what you're up to to keep up with you? Do you do social media or anything like that or have a website where they can uh, know what's going on in the world of Richard Stanley? Um, not beyond my Facebook at the moment. That's what I get for being a, a, a quasi-medievalist who's been living <laughs> on top of the mountain for too long. But uh, maybe I'll get around to getting a website at some point. But at the moment, I'm still pretty hard to find. All right. Well, well hopefully we'll... Uh, We'll try to keep the word out and keep in touch with you and let everybody know. And uh, uh, we enjoyed the movie. We're going to have a review up for everybody to watch as well. Uh, but you should go check out The Color Out of Space from Richard Stanley's Return Back to Feature Films. H.P. Lovecraft it comes out in theaters January 24th. Uh, hopefully we can talk to you again, um, sir, and, uh, and you know get more detailed into it. I know we didn't have a lot of time today. It's been an absolute pleasure. But, uh, yeah, if you do go and see the movie, try and see it in the decent auditorium. Because that ultrasound and the infrasound of the whole uh, approach of the film, which is to um, really drag one to the, out, the outer limits of human consciousness, is something that pays dividends to see on a, on a large screen, preferably with an audience. Absolutely, yeah. Hopefully, yeah, we're going to go out and see it, uh, see it in theaters as well. We watched it 
for the review, but yeah, I definitely want to check it out with the with the intense audio and the. But it's it's great. It's it's definitely different and uh, definitely hits you um, with the you know the the mystique and the, the you know with all the color. I don't want to give too much away, but yeah, go check out the movie. It's great, and uh, it was a pleasure speaking to you. And hopefully, we'll get to chat again soon. I gotta take care of that, sir. All right, thank Thanks you. For this. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, there it was. Writer director Richard Stanley. Go see the movie. Check out our movie review for The Color Out of Space and also our uh, interview with Mr. Elliot Knight as well. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Replicon Radio. Find us at replicanradio.com and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at replicon underscore radio.